Hey there, preachers. It's Joy J. Moore here. I wanted to share my gratitude for each and every one of you who've given so generously to our fall fundraising campaign so far. Thank you. Did you know that you can make monthly gifts to Working Preacher? Monthly gifts are a great budget-friendly option to fit any needs, and every gift makes an impact. In fact, we have a special gift for a limited number of monthly donors. If you're one of the first 10 donors to make a recurring gift of $10 per month or more to this ministry, then you'll receive a book by Walter Brueggemann in the Working Preacher book series titled Preaching Jeremiah, Announcing God's Restorative Passion. Or, if you're already giving monthly and increase your monthly gift, you could also be one of the 10 donors to receive the book. I feel blessed to be a part of this Working Preacher community with you. Your investment in this ministry provides the tools that thousands upon thousands of preachers around the world rely on as part of their weekly or daily routine. So head over to workingpreacher.org slash donate to make your gift online before the campaign ends on October 31st. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for the 23rd Sunday after Pentecost, uh, which falls on October 20th, 2024, uh, are from Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 through 12. Our uh, semi-continuous reading is from Job 38, verses 1 through 7, or you can include 34 uh, uh, through 41. Um, the psalm is 91, verses 9 through 16. Our epistle would be Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And our gospel is the 10th chapter of Mark, now reading verses 35 through 45. So we're still in the 10th chapter of Mark, making our way. Not there yet. Making our way. Our third third Sunday in Mark, and we'll have one more coming up, and then we're through chapter 10. But what I mentioned this last week, but what we do, the passage that is skipped in chapter 10 in the lectionary is that third passion prediction yes. in verses 32 to 34, which heightens then the request of James and John mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the contrast between what Jesus foretelling his death and resurrection uh, and going back to what does, you know, what does take up your cross really mean? And then this is, this is what they ask in response. And so it's important just to remind preachers of that narrative literary context that, that makes this, make this, makes this request all the more, uh, as, as we like to say in Minnesota, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> we should point out as well that uh, even though we're almost done with Mark chapter 10 and Jesus will enter Jerusalem in chapter 11, we are going to have other passages like this that bring up the question of how people in authority should act and how they do act and what responsible uses of power uh, look like in the kingdom. And, and this in some ways introduces that uh, here at the end of October. It's a topic on a lot of people's minds in terms of thinking about leadership and and what greatness looks like. The, uh, the, the, um, this is what true discipleship is, right? I mean, this is kind of, again, at the heart, like you were saying, Caroline, the heart of, of what does it mean to deny oneself and, and take up one's cross and to see just how opposite that looks from what the world values. When Jesus talks about the rulers who lord it over them and the great ones who are tyrants over them, and these are intensified Greek verbs here, right? These are about using your advantages, your positions of power, like to the extreme, to the max, they might have said back in the 1980s. <laughs> um, and, and that's how you get ahead, right? And that's what James and John appear to be um, imagining for themselves. I think it's not another, 
Oh, go ahead, Joy. You go this time. Nope, you go this time. I went last time. <laughs> well, I was I was going to point us to verse forty four. Um, and 45, for the son of man came not to serve, but to be served and give his life as a ransom for many, that that really does it. what you were just saying, Matt, that it summarizes Jesus' ministry and what it means to take up your cross mm-hmm. uh, and the kind of, the kind, of, and, and we've talked about this before, but the kind of ministry that, or the kind of experience Jesus himself uh experienced in the wilderness. And so that, mm. that verb of to serve was the, that the, um, that the angels, angels in the wilderness served him, not, you know, I think the translation is waited on, but they served him. And that also the Simon Peter's mother-in-law, when she is healed, then, then she's described as in this act of service. And so it is characteristic then of Jesus ministry also, also what he experienced, but but also characteristic of the kingdom of God, and so it, and and also then again to cast, you know, what does it mean to you know take up your cross uh, and deny yourself? It it gives another angle, I think, to that as well of of imagining that call of Jesus through the lens of of service, and since we are at the end of getting close to the end of Mark, uh, the, the, you know, Mark 10 and into the triumphal entry in, into Jerusalem. It, it is a moment of pause then to look back and say, what has this minute, what has this service looked like? How has Jesus embodied this service throughout these last 10 chapters? Where have we seen it in Jesus? Where have we seen it in others? And so it, then it expands an understanding of what service is. I think that's that would be important in a sermon if you chose to, to go in that direction. I appreciate that, uh, and I'm holding on. It 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 pairs very well. I'm still holding on to um, Matt's reminder. You know that we're at the end of October, and what does greatness look like? Um, what do our leaders look like? What do our leaders call? And I think this can also be a reminder that those who are closest to Jesus um, risk missing this denial of self that you're talking about, Caroline, that here these two disciples who have been with Jesus all along want to make sure of their position as opposed to recognizing who Jesus is. And whenever we get distracted away from what is, how does this, or how will this benefit me? um, We sideline who is Jesus and what is Jesus making possible for all the world. And, uh, and that's a risk that we need to attend to for ourselves who call ourselves followers of Christ. We risk that too. I love how the 10 respond that they get angry at James and John. <laughs> it's not clear if they've been outflanked you know, or what, what their, what their reasoning is. Um, but I love that. Then Jesus calls you know, all 12 of them. Like, all right, look, <laughs> this is how it goes. Uh, so, you know, you can play around with that. I think as a preacher, have, have some fun with that, that James and John are maybe more representative of, of, of a larger group of people than they might appear to be. Uh, but then also, you know, verse 45, I would I would caution preachers not to go too deep into ransom and giving one's life for many. There's a, a lot written about what what in the world that might mean. Um, and it's one of the very few places in Mark's gospel where Jesus refers to his death as something that has an effect. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and in this case, it's not necessarily like a payment. Right, we tend to think of ransom in English as how much money do you need? And somebody you know, kidnaps, kidnaps you. Yeah, yeah. and right. and ransom, uh, the term that's used for ransom here has more of a sense of a liberating moment. Right. Yes, right. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be what's the word I'm looking for? An exchange, right, or right. A, a transaction. Yeah, but it oh, it has um, 
a release or liberation uh, deliver, mm-hmm. <laughs> and mm-hmm. uh, and especially how this particular moment in Mark has been, uh, and the commentary points this out that. that uh, source of atonement theories of right. what what Jesus' death actually means, but it, it's a really give us life as a as a as a liberation for many, mm-hmm. as a as a deliverance for many. Really has a different sound to it, and so if you are going to go in that direction of what of tackling this potentially well known <laughs> uh, phrase of what Jesus' death means, to cast it in that light. Uh, and and particularly um, particularly at the end of chapter ten, where where you think about what did the rich man need to be delivered from? Oh, um, right. What where where is it that Jesus' life and death and resurrection are uh, are is means deliverance for us or liberation for us? Um, and liberation toward what, and deliverance toward what, and so I think there could be a lot of homiletical possibilities there too. Definitely appreciate that. Bad news for fans of C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy, where the lead character is Ransom, at least in one of the books, maybe two. Anyway, so there's that. I, I, you could refer back to Mark chapter three, where Jesus tells the parable of the strong man. You know, yeah, that the. the the strong man has to be bound so that his his stuff can be liberated, can be looted, right? And I mean, the image there is is a violent one of Jesus uh, binding Satan, Satan, so that a liberation might occur. Really, a theft in that mm-hmm. in that imagery. Okay, and we've got the pairing of the Isaiah fifty three. The yeah, that's one of the reasons I I harped on the ransom language. I know. I figured. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so. <laughs> Isaiah 53 is beautiful. I just don't see this language in Mark's gospel. That um, I, I worry that the Isaiah 53 text is trying to push the Mark 10 text in a particular direction that mm-hmm. it doesn't necessarily, necessarily have to go. go. Mm-hmm. We can disagree about that, or we could talk about that, or we could just talk about Isaiah 53 on its own merits. Imagine Let's that. Let's talk about it on its own merit, because I think uh, we agree yeah. that um, we're not reading it in the way that it has so often been uh, presented that does link those two. Um, and I think, uh, Caroline, you've set us up real well, or uh, wh- whichever of you said first, using the word liberative, um, mm. that this becomes um, just what does it mean, whether we're talking about sickness, whether we're talking about affliction, whether we're talking about the things that have the wrongs that we have done and the wrongs that have been done to us in all of them, we are liberated from that because Jesus bore that for us. Um, uh, and it, it makes possible um, wholeness. Um, I'm trying to think of the language. Um, if the evil one is, is looted, um, what, what is left is, is, is our blessing. If a if a preacher wanted to spend time with this text and, and really give it you know front and center attention, um, it'd be really useful to help people get a sense for how it's been interpreted in different ways, and mm-hmm. that uh, even among Jews there is not uniform mm-hmm. agreement in terms of what Isaiah is talking about. Even among Christians, you read this and you think well, this sounds a lot like Jesus. Uh, it also sounds like a lot more than Jesus sounds like in, in addition to, and to help people get a sense that, you know, we can read the same text and a text can support a variety of different meanings and to help people imagine, let's just assume this, what if this is Isaiah's way of talking about Israel and the nation itself and the experience of the nation and the humiliation and violence of conquest and exile and for Isaiah to take what's a rather bold step to say, even in that suffering, something new will arise or a good will arise from that many will be made righteous because of that. And how I, how I say it's kind of bold or daring or risky, it's it's at risk of becoming a way of saying, well, they suffered so I don't have to. Mm. I don't think mm. it's exactly what Isaiah is getting at here, yeah. but Isaiah, without diminishing the horrors, is also trying to look at how does God bring life from death and mm-hmm. 
you know, those are questions that only survivors get to ask and answer. I get that. Right? The victims of history don't get to write theology for the most part. So how do we do that in ways that are responsible, that acknowledge the loss and the awfulness while still saying, now what does that lay upon us in terms of our responsibility to live going forward um, in God's world? I really appreciate that, Matt, because I think it is important. I made that um, that uh, Jesus move, and I think it's real important, uh, if I can say it this way, that all of our interpretations are based on what we already know or what we're already holding in our mind. And uh, in the couple of weeks just that you know we've just gone past, we've talked about some uh, things that were in our mind as we were reading these various texts, uh, basically kind of negatively, to kind of saying, let's correct some of these. In this particular case, um, understanding it first, as you've lifted up, in of Israel, in exile, what is happening to them in real time in their context, but also knowing that Isaiah is a story that has been repeated over and over among uh, Israel to know who they are, to know what they've been through. And so that understanding and knowing these scriptures in the first century, their, that imagination would cause Jesus to get their attention. Uh, so um, I don't want to suggest that this absolutely is a prophecy of Jesus that we read about, but that there's a recognition of all these promises of what the children of God are supposed to look like. And wow, doesn't this man look like that and more? So all we right, move on. Ah, here we are. Now now the whirlwind. Mm-hmm. That got here quickly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, already 38? It's only week four? Not for Job, though. Not at all. <laughs> exactly. Yes. And that goes back to what we were what I mentioned at the very beginning of of this series and Job is, you know, over 40 chapters of or you know, close to 40 chapters of of God's silence of that suffering and sitting there. And then we finally, you know, we finally hear from, we finally hear from God is a, it's a long time to sit. I think tone of voice matters a lot mm. for verses two through seven. As, yes. <laughs> yes. As somebody's reading this, mm-hmm. who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Like this is when Job's like, I might've requested the wrong thing by demanding an <laughs> audience with God. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, this could be really hostile and aggressive on God's part. It doesn't necessarily have to be, but it is kind of this, you know, where were you when the foundations of the earth? <laughs> like, yeah. Tell me, like, what, how much information are you working with versus how much information I'm working with? I mean, it's, and it's, I hope that preachers don't treat this as kind of a divine rebuke. Mm. Don't do that. As much as this is what it feels like to encounter the enormity of God and the reality of all of these things, where Joe, I think, probably starts to feel really, really small oh. uh, in a hurry here. I mean, I feel small reading this. Yeah. 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 But how is that also a blessing or how is that also liberating to be to, to undergo that experience? Mm. Yeah. That's what I need a preacher to help me with. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I think tone of voice. And uh, sitting with, and I hope before you've gotten to this, um, as you've looked at this over the last four weeks, where is it going? And paying attention to the fact that um, it's not, we talked about this when we were talking about Mark a few weeks ago, it's not a black and white answer. It's not a this or that. There's a lot of ambiguity in this. This isn't responding to justice the way we think justice should be meted out as in the wrongness of the four friends that give Job a response. And so when Job says, okay, God, I want to talk to you, and God says, okay, I'll talk with you, if God is good, and at the end of the day, that's where we end up saying God is, then let's let this tone be an invitation. Um, And I just, I just, 
been working with um, uh, the Ten Commandments again, teaching an ethics class uh, down here in in Montgomery. And um, before God gives the Ten Commandments, God says, I'm the God that did this. And so before God begins to sound like there's an expectation from Israel, God says, remember what you've just experienced and how you've seen me show up. And that tone could be the way of beginning this. Um, Job, you want to talk to me. Let's pay attention to all the details you haven't been thinking about because you and your friends have made this very human-centered. You've been doing a lot of navel-gazing, and I've got the whole universe in my mindset. Uh, Every act of humanity has an imprint or consequence on the entire cosmos. So while I'm attending to you, I'm also continuing to attend to the whole universe that I've created. Have you got that in mind? And then I once heard an interpreter say, God lets uh, um, Job hear the description of what God has done in creation. And as you said, uh, Matt, you feel small reading this. It's another description for us to just realize the greatness and grandness of God. And that seems to be how Job responds. Job responds by saying, yep, God, you're all that and then some, and I'm, I'm going to be, hum- uh, I'm going to express humility and repentance. And if you preach in a way where your um, listeners are left doubting God, then you've become the voice of the accuser. But if you're, if you leave where people are humbled and trust God, then you've, I think you've properly brought them through, through this encounter of Job and the creator of the universe. Yeah, I think it's really curious to the rhetorical style of this, of this speech from God. I mean, it could have been it it could have been all declarative and not questions. Yeah. And it could have just been uh I'm the one who laid the foundation of the earth. I'm the one who determined, it, you know, uh I, uh, and and instead, um, you know, I'm the one that has put wisdom in the inward parts and given understanding to the mind. And instead, it's this questions that that, like you said, Matt, it could it, it could sound like rebuke, or it could be also this this reminder, as you were saying, Joy, an affirmation. Oh, you know, who 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 who. You, Lord, you, O Lord, you, God, you, God, you, God, you, God. And so it it asks for then that response from the listener as well. It puts us in that place of Job to also respond and say, oh, yes, you, you, God, it's you, God, it's you, God. It's not me. It's you. It's you. It's you. And I think that's also kind of a key to what we're saying as well is that that if we can capture that that rhetorical, uh, that rhetorical style and that, that asked for response in this, it's really what we're really what's happening here. And if I dare say, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, and you didn't say this, Caroline, so I'm not, this is not like contesting anything, but, um, the, the trick in preaching is not to, with this, I think is not to leave people with the impression that everything happens for a good reason. That no. What's going on here with God is God saying, if you only knew all the stuff I knew, you'd realize what a great God I am. Right. Um, that the part of the lesson here, at least as I read the ending, the last couple of chapters of Job is it's a chaotic world. Yeah. And it's a violent world. It's a dangerous world. And God didn't, God is in the throes of that, right? You don't, Finding God is not about escaping from that, but that God meets us in the throes. And so there's a mystery there, but there's no, there's no, um, what's the word I want? I mean, there's no kind of safe answer that gets given here. And nor is it a safe God, if by safe we mean 
trust me, everything's going to work out just perfectly for yes. you. You know what I mean? Because Job, that's the story of Job, right? It's the reason why Job is so blameless and why Job is so upstanding. Because if anybody didn't deserve this, it's him. And Job has not lied about his uprightness. Right. So again, that's the, I think people sometimes run too quickly to like, oh, this just tells us to trust God all the more because there's really a secret plan for me that I just yeah. haven't seen yet. And it's all beautiful. And I just have to make sure I stay on the path. So there, I, I, we agree. I really, I, we do agree on that, but I really appreciate that. And I love that idea um, that evil exists and that even trusting God isn't safe. It's still dangerous. Uh, and our understanding of justice is that if I do these things, if I follow God, my life is going to be easy. There'll be no more problems. And this is exactly, that's not how it works yet. Because the end that God is yet promising has not yet come to be. And uh, what I was going to say uh, a moment ago was, in a way, Caroline, this is that denial of self because it turns the attention away from, but I did everything I was supposed to do, God. Why aren't you blessing me? To it's dangerous to live in a chaotic world. And it would be even more dangerous to live in that chaotic world without a faithful God. All right, Psalm 91. Any? Oh, we skipped the psalm. <laughs> Let me do that. Okay, wait a minute. It's in here somewhere. Well, in some ways, this is the, the psalm might lead to the kind of interpretation of Job I was worried about. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure the psalm is supposed to necessarily compliment Job, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? It's, it's very much, you know, no evil shall befall you, right? Because you've trusted in God. And so, right. in some ways, it's a, in some ways, Job is a pushback against this kind of yes. wisdom, is pushback mm -hmm. against this piety. Mm hmm. Yeah, and and at the same time, though, it is this, uh, it is a a confession, uh, it with regard to, I mean, as you were talking about joy, uh, this kind of trust in God, um, mm -hmm. of what you know, or or hearing these words of promise from God that, um, you know that. Uh, you shall not dash your foot against a stone. And so there's, I mean, it, and depending on where your sermon goes and where people are, they might need, they might need these words of, exactly. <laughs> of, of trust and hope. And, and um, that at the end, you know, at the end of the day, when you, like the commentary talked about with Job, that there's, you can't tie up everything in a little, you know, a nice little bow and pretend that everything's going to be okay. There are no easy answers. And then sometimes you're fine with that. And sometimes you, you just, your only response can be something like this. Like, I know there's no nice, neat bow, but <laughs> Can I still, can I still believe in the one? I mean, I still believe in the one who will deliver me. And so exactly. it, in that sense, it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of a, a response to, you know, where do you, a human response to where we don't want to sit and where we don't want to be. Um, so that, yeah, but yeah. Hebrews five, one through 10. Yeah. So, um, this is uh, the priest that is the ultimate priest is Melchizedek. I, I referenced this uh, last week. Um, uh, morally flawless, unlike the uh, Israelites, uh, 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 their priests, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, sons of Aaron there, um, they, um, they, they weren't always flawless. Um, and so here we have the priest that is mentioned back in Genesis um, as being uh, the priest above priest. And so we actually get Jesus above Aaron, Jesus above the priest, even though he's not a descendant of Aaron, but he's in the line of the high priest, um, uh, Melchizedek. I always have to stumble over that. And, um, um, for me, there's also kind of this sense that if Melchizedek is not Israel, then 
this is God remembering all the world. Jesus, son of David, the promise made to David, yes, but Jesus, son of God, the promise made to all the world that is scattered, of whom maybe Melchizedek is in that line, and he's greater than that priest. I think one thing that's really interesting about this particular section of Hebrews is a little bit of a different angle on the incarnation mm-hmm. uh, and that claim of of that specific claim of you know God begotten. So you have you are my son today. I have begotten you, uh, and then. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications. And so there's this emphasis on the, you know, the incarnation of Jesus, the the belief, the doctrine of the incarnation that gives it a, just a little bit different spin mm-hmm. on what does it mean to have a, a begotten God? What does it mean to have, mm-hmm. you know, the, to use John language, the word became flesh. There and it is. So, yeah. So that, <laughs> that. I, I think I might go in that direction where I, I because I preaching on the doctrine of the incarnation or preaching on the meaning of the incarnation um, is is challenging and we often uh, save it for Christmas mm-hmm. uh, you know and and a lot of our incarnational I think theology is wrapped up in that and so I think it offers the preacher to in, to engage in talking about the meaning of the incarnation and using different language different imagery and particularly at different time of the church year to say mm-hmm. what are the what mm-hmm. are the promises of the incarnation that we don't really talk about? Yeah, I like that, and it's and it's um, it's a view of the incarnation that's not theoretical, right? It's still yeah. very much centered in the reality of who Jesus is. So back to chapter two, right? We now see Jesus, and now you've got this. He's able to. Uh, this is verse two. Able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward. I mean, this is now. Uh, this is not a treatise on incarnation in the abstract. No, this is about this God who's the imprint of the eternal God, um, who's gentle, who's understanding, who's close by, which in some ways, right, adds a bit of a gloss to, um, uh, well, it, it might be said to expand what we read in Mark 10, but also in some ways adds a bit of a gloss to uh, the God we meet in the whirlwind in Job as well. Sermon Brainwave is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. Working Preacher has been a trusted source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers worldwide since 2007. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org slash brainwave. And be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.